Good morning and welcome to Casino Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Stephen Gord and I want to thank you for joining with me today. I think for many of us, what's on our mind at the moment is very much still COVID-19. And we need to be praying, not just for those people in Victoria, but for everyone around the world that's been highly impacted through this time. Now, you probably have been hearing from our own uh, state government that they have been encouraging people to wear face masks when they are in, particularly in shopping centres and in any uh, indoor venue. Our association has taken on that same encouragement and would strongly encourage all churches, and that includes us, to be doing the same thing. So our encouragement is if you do come to Casino Baptist Church and we meet at 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning, that when you do, please, uh, if you want to, and we recommend that you do, wear a mask that can help yourself and others through this situation. Also at this time, uh, if you do visit, we ask that you keep to the COVID safety requirements, whether that is physical distancing, uh, whether that is just putting the offering in the box at the back, however it might be, just to keep to the general COVID safety requirements so that we can meet safely together, because that is really what we want to do. We want to be a place where people can come, people can hear about the love of Jesus and be safe. Also, uh, when we're thinking about the life of the church, can you also be in prayer for next Sunday? If you can't be with us, we will be having a church meeting. So at 11 o'clock next Sunday, so at our location, straight after church, we'll be getting together to hold a church meeting. And part of that is to uh, take on board as a church uh, our requirements for safety procedures, a safe church policy and other things so that we can look ahead to be, in a bigger sense, more than COVID-19 safe, that we can be a safe place for our folk, for our church leaders, our children, vulnerable people and our community. So please, be in prayer for that time. And if you can make it, I would love to see you next Sunday at 11 o'clock for the church service. Well, today we are going to continue looking at our series in the book of Exodus. And we're going to look at a quite a number of chapters today. We're going to look at chapters 13 through to chapters 18. No, we're not going to read it all. No, we're not going to go through it verse by verse. But we're just going to touch on the great things that God does and then think about how do the people respond? And then for us today, when we see the great things that God does, how can we respond today? So if you've got your Bibles, you might like to take them out and turn with me to Exodus chapter 13 through to 18. But before we look at God's word today, let me just spend some time in prayer. So let me lead us in prayer. Gracious Father, we do thank you that you're a God who's in control. We thank you that you're a God who loves us. We thank you that you're a God who is with us every single day. So Lord, no matter what we face, we offer our lives up to you. We offer our church, we offer our community up to you today and ask, Father, that you can use us in this place. We ask, Father, that you'll be able to work through us, that as your spirit helps us to grow in faith, we can be the people you want us to be. So Lord, bless our lives today. As we open your book uh, to look at Exodus today, Father, help us to learn from it, I pray, in your name. Amen. And as we just think of briefly of prayer, please keep praying for those in our church, uh, like Jan and others who are not well at this time. Keep praying for healing, keep praying for miracles, because we have a God who can do miracles. And we're going to see some of those actually today. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapters 13 through to 18. And as we begin, I want you to think about, have you ever been truly, truly thirsty? I mean desperate. You are so desperate for a drink that maybe in your mind you're already starting to think, I will do anything for a drink. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Have you ever felt like that? If you have, what would you have done to get a drink? Think about that for a moment. You probably know that I love history and I love true stories from history. And I remember this story back from World War I. 
and uh, the Anzacs had joined uh, with the British army. They were helping liberate Palestine. So you can imagine that setting. It's going to be in the desert. And the fighting in the desert's gone on and on. And the Anzacs are pursuing uh, the Turkish army. And they come to this city. And at the moment, the Anzacs have run out of water. And the number of their soldiers are dying. More are dying from dehydration and lack of water than actually from the enemy's bullets. Desperate, desperate situation. Desperate, desperate thirst. And they've come to this town that is being held in the middle of the desert by the Turkish army. And they could see the water in that town. They could hear the water running in the cisterns that they have in that town. Now, you're one of those soldiers. You're, you're there. You're one of the Anzac or British troops. What are you going to do? You know, the, the soldiers look around. The leaders look at their own men and say, we have to take that town tonight. If we don't take it, then we're going to die from thirst. So one huge, great battle, one last great effort. And they push the Turkish army out of that town and they enter the town. Now, remember I said, imagine you are there. So, great battle. You've survived it. You're desperate for thirst. You get into town and the water's right there. What do you do? What do the leaders do? What do the army officers do? Well, what they do, they don't just say, go drink. No, they don't do that at all. They say, line up. Line up in your battle groups. Line up in your battalions. Line up, but don't drink. Then they say, feed those who are sick. They can get a drink. The horses and other animals, they can get a drink. The prisoners, they can get a drink. Those who are going to be on guard duty, you can go get a drink. And then, battalion by battalion, they're let go to get a drink and in that order. So imagine that. Imagine being one of the last soldiers in the last battalion to go get a drink. You've stood there 20 metres away from the water. You can see it. You can probably smell it. You're desperate for it. But you don't move. You don't move a muscle. You just stand there and you wait your turn. Why? Because your officers your leaders had told you to do it that way. Why would you listen to them? If you're so desperate, if you're thinking, I'm going to die if I don't get a drink, why would you stay there? Why would you listen to them? Why would you obey? Because those officers had led them through good times and through bad. And because their men trusted them, they stood there, they listened and they obeyed what they were told. That, I think, is amazing. It was amazing that they took the town. That's even more amazing. Now, if you were there, what would you have done? Would you have been able to stand there and wait your turn maybe up to four hours before you got a drink? How would you have responded? Now, I wonder if you've ever actually been in that situation. I know I haven't. I haven't been that desperately thirsty before. Yeah, maybe a bit parched and other things, but not that way. And I know even when I was parched, I was looking for a drink, but so desperately thirsty. And they listened and obeyed because they trusted their leaders. Well, when we think about that, and I want us to be thinking about that, I think we get a similar picture as we come to look at these chapters of Exodus and start to unpack what happens from chapter 13 onwards. Yeah, we looked at last week that God, through the last plague, was able to convince Pharaoh to let God's people go. So we had the Passover, we, they had that first meal, and we got to understand what all that meant, that the angel of death passed over the people who did what God said, who obeyed God, put the blood from the lamb around their doorframe, ate the meal that they have done that meal ever since, once a year, to remind themselves of all the great things that God did, that God was in control, that God was powerful, that God saved them, 
not just their firstborn children, but saved the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery. They were let loose. They were let free. They could now leave. And that's where we sort of pick up the story today. Because here, again, it's not, say, Moses or Aaron, they're, they're earthly leaders. They're not really the leaders. The leader's God. God tells Moses and Aaron what to say and what to do, and they do it. So the picture here is God is leading his people. He led them and starts to lead them out of Egypt. And we get that even clearer in chapter 13. In verse 21 and 22, it says this, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. God would go before them. God would lead them. Very visibly, God was right there leading his people out of slavery in Egypt and leading them to safety. Now, in this situation, maybe you know the rest of the story, but if you don't, just think about it for a moment. What do you think God would do with them here? Yeah, they've got to get out of Egypt. They've got to get out as fast as possible. Remember, when they ate the Passover meal, they had to be dressed in such a way that they were going to race out the door. So God has then led them. They're out. They're starting to move away from Egypt. What do you think God is going to do with them? Where do you think God is going to lead them? Is God just going to say, run for it? Or does he do something else? Because he actually tells them to do something else here. Now, you would think that if you were one of the Israelites, you'd probably give Usain Bolt a run for his money. You know, he has the 100-meter record, 200-meter records, all of those type of records. Great sprinter. You'd probably give him a run for his money because you want to get out of this place as fast as possible. You want to run. But God does something different. And God's leading the people here. So you've got the pillar of flame at night and, and the column of smoke during the daytime. And it st they start to leave Egypt. Where do you think it's going to go? Well, the obvious answer is, you know, it's got to keep going. Because remember the promises from Genesis and the promises we looked at at the beginning of the book of Exodus? God said, I've been fulfilling these promises, but there's one that still needs to be fulfilled. You need a land. So they don't know where it is. But God has said, I'm going to take you, I'm going to lead you out of Egypt to the promised land. So that's where you would expect. You've got this pillar in front of you. You would expect that it would be going along and it would be leading you straight away from Egypt as fast as possible. Day, night, you're going to run for it, right? Well, you watch. As Just imagine, you're one of the people in Israel. You're following Moses and Aaron. You're following the flame. You're following the smoke. And it starts to go away from Egypt. Yep, yep, this is good. Then it slows down. Not so, you know, trying to work out what's happening here. And then it turns around. Instead of leading away from Egypt, it turns around and it heads straight back towards Egypt. Why? Why would God do this? God has said, I'm going to save my people. I'm going to lead them to the promised land. Why would he lead them out, round and straight back? towards Egypt. Why? Why would this possibly happen? Because God wants the Egyptians to catch up. Now just think about that for a moment. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? You can read about this in chapter 14. It sounds crazy. God heads back to Egypt because he wants the Egyptians to catch up. And when they start to catch up, he turns around again and starts heading away again. And the Egyptians, which have now caught up, are following along behind. Do you get the picture why? What God wants here is God wants to do another miracle. Now we know it as the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea, where God's, God parts the Red Sea, Moses and the uh, Israelites head through. When the Egyptians follow, God pronounces his judgment on the Jewish army and the waters crash back in on them and destroys them. And then Moses and the rest of the Israelites on the other side of the Red Sea keep heading off towards the Promised Land. Okay, we, we know that as the biggest story here. This is the miracle that happens in these chapters. But as we read that, why did God do it? 
Did God do it because he just wanted to punish the Egyptians? Well, I don't think so. I think God wanted it, and that's partly why he turned around and went back to the Egyptians, made sure that they could catch up and then headed off again. I think God wanted his people, the Israelites, to actually see another miracle. He wants them to understand what he's done for them. He wants them to understand he is the one God in control of all things that can do anything, and he is leading his people to safety. He wants them to love and follow him. So he says, look at what I can do. Look at how great I am. And they see it with the uh, parting of the Red Sea and then crashing back down again. And God is leading his people. God is protecting his people. Now you would expect at this stage, Yeah, life is good for the Israelites. They would be following God. They'd be praising him. And as we jump into chapter 15, we start to see that Moses and then Miriam sing praises to God. Yeah, life is good for the Israelites. They see that they have this great God who's leading them, protecting them. They give thanks. They praise him for all that he's doing. A few chapters, a few verses later in chapter 15, we read this. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they travelled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That's why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Now Marah, as it says here, means bitter And I wonder if you ever realized that the word there is still the same word that we use for bitter today, or more importantly, salt water. When you think of marine life or mariner, it all comes from the same root word meaning bitter, salty water, yuck, in other words. That's what this place is called. But what has changed here? Now, we've only moved from one chapter to another, Or they've been praising God, thanking God, miracle of the Red Sea. They have seen God's power. They've seen God's judgment. God is still leading them. What has changed? Now here, they says verse 24, the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? Are the people praising God? Doesn't sound like it. Are they rejoicing that God is leading them? doesn't look like it. They've stumbled, started to stumble, they've started to complain, and they're grumbling. Why? Because they're thirsty. Now, is it wrong to be thirsty? No. Is it, dis, is it wrong to be disappointed? No. Is it wrong to say that these circumstances that they're in are marrow, are bitter? No. What's wrong here is that they start to blame Moses. What have we got to drink? Where are we going to get something to drink? They're blaming Moses. And as I mentioned earlier, just briefly, blaming Moses, Moses was just the figurehead, the symbol for God leading them. So when they blame Moses, they're actually blaming God. They're blaming God. God, you're not giving us something to drink. Now look at the response here from Moses, verse 25 and 26. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, And the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, now what he's saying to them is, I want you to obey me, says God. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to uh, provide for you. Here's fresh water for you to drink. Here's the test. Are you going to obey me? Are you going to do what I tell you to do? Now, when the people grumbled, Moses didn't grumble. Moses just came straight back to God and prayed and said, God, uh, these people, what do we do? And God answered and he provided for his people again. Now, it says here that God did it to test them. 
God wants to know whether the Israelites are going to follow him in the good times, remember they praise God, and the bad. Because we know just here, they just don't have a drink, and they're already starting to complain against God. Things are going to get a lot worse. Are they, when the times are bad, are they still going to obey and follow God? Or are they going to be fair weather believers? Do they just follow God when they get what they want? So God's putting them here to the test. And he very explicitly tells them that's what's going to happen. So if you were in that situation, you'd probably say, yep, yep, now I understand God. I'm going to make sure that no matter what happens, you're leading us, you're protecting us, you're providing for us. We're okay with you, God. We'll just keep following you. You tell us to do something, we're going to do it. You'd probably say that. Let's look what happens to the Israelites. And at the end of chapter 15, it ends with this blessing from God. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. Now, it's a lovely, beautiful oasis, a spot that reminds them of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 70 elders. Yeah, it's symbolic. Life here is good. And then we open chapter 16 with this. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt, in the desert the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. What's going on? Yeah, I mean, life was good for God's people. And they praised God. Life was a little bit uh, tricky. You know, we need a drink. They grumbled. God provided. God took them to this oasis. Life is good. But now they start to grumble again. And more than that, they say, we wish we were back in Egypt. We wish we were back in slavery. We wish that God had just killed us back then. What's going on? I mean, God provides for them. God's still protecting them. And they grumble. So God, again, out of his glorious mercy and grace, provides for them again. Uh, quail to eat and manna, which is a bread, comes from heaven. A great miracle. Yeah, Life for them is good again. And so they start to praise God. They start to celebrate. And Moses even institutes the Sabbath day to be a day of rest, to remember all that God has done for them. But look what happens again at the beginning of chapter 17. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, travelling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water to drink. So they quarrelled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? Remember, God had said, I am giving you a test. They're failing. But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? God is leading them. God is protecting them. God is providing for them. And their response? They grumble. They complain. They say once again, God should have just put us to death because you, God has brought us out here to die. What was the point of walking all this distance just to die anyway? It's basically what they're saying. Again, God out of his mercy and his grace provides for them. A rock splits and fresh water comes out so that they can drink. At this time, enemies attack God's people. And we have the great story where Moses, as long as he keeps his hands raised, then God's people are victorious. As soon as his arms start to drop, the enemy starts to get a foothold. But we see God protect his people and the Israelites gain victory. And God leads, God protects, God provides in the good times and the bad. He's always there leading his people. The challenge is, how will the people respond? Will the people respond out of thankfulness and praise and obedience and follow? Or are they going to grumble and complain and start to turn away from God? Now, what choice are they going to make? I wanted you to put yourselves in that position. If you were there, how would you respond? 
And I want us to think about this for a moment. Imagine that God in the pillar of flame or smoke is there in front of you. He's leading you. It's obvious he's leading you. You've seen him provide food from heaven in quail and manna. We've got water coming out of the rock. You've got uh, the Red Sea opening and then closing. You've got all these great miracles. You see, God is powerful. God is providing. God is protecting you. The enemies attack. God gives you victory. You're seeing this almighty God protecting, providing for you. Right there, physically, in front of you. How do you respond? The same choice that the Israelites had. Will they respond out of obedience? Will they do what God says? Or will they grumble? Will they reject what God has done? And what would you do if you were there? Because why I want us to think about this is because for us today, we physically, we we might say, yes, we have the Bible. Yes, we know that God is in control. Yes, we can see God in all of creation. Yes, we know that God hears our prayers and answers. We can say that. But really, when you start to think of the story in the Old Testament, we don't physically have God in front of us as though he was a pillar of flame or smoke or something like that, do we? We don't have visible miracles like the parting of the Red Sea happening every day in front of us, do we? So in a way, we could say we don't actually have God physically in front of us, talking to us, leading us, doing things for us that we can see openly and easily. Now, we we can say that. So if that's the case, how do we know that he's leading us? Now, we might say, well, if he's leading us, we know by reading his word. True. Might be by talking to more mature Christians about choices we have to make in life, how God might be leading us in that. Again, true. Maybe it's through prayer as well, that we actually have to take time, not just to pray through our choices, but to wait and to listen for God to respond. Now, these are ways so that we can know how he wants to lead us. So do we? Do we actually know in your life today, do you know how God wants to lead you? What he wants you to do with your life? How he wants you to live? If the answer is yes, great. But are you doing it? Because we have the same choice that they had. Remember, their choice was that they could obey God, do what God had said, or they could grumble, they could complain, and they could start to turn away from God. And for us, the same choice is there. So today, where is God leading you? Where's God leading your family? In a week's time, we've got a church meeting. Where is God going to lead our church when we come to that? And be praying about that as we make some decisions uh, at that meeting. And God physically, out the front, led, cared for, protected the Israelites. They had a choice. Sometimes they did follow him. Sometimes they obeyed what he said. Other times they made a choice to grumble and to complain and to go away. To turn their back on God because their grumbling meant that they didn't really believe God protected them. They didn't really believe that God would provide. They didn't really believe that God was all powerful. That's what their grumbling was saying. But God answered them with miracle after miracle. God led And as we looked at last week, God acts in our world. So they had that choice. And we have the same choice today. So when God is leading you today, if life is going well for you, great. Are you following God when life is well? If life is maybe not going well, maybe financial, relationship relationship issues or work issues, maybe it's COVID-19, In the midst of that, do you still believe God is leading you? Where is God leading you? And are you responding out of obedience in following where God is leading you? I think for the Israelites, and we're going to unpack this a little bit more as we go ahead, that is going to be their constant challenge. They see God. They know God. They know how God wants them to worship him. But they have a choice every day. Are they going to do it or not? Just because they are called an Israelite, just because they are called God's people, 
They've still got that choice. Will they obey or will they not? And it's the same for us. You know, even if you this morning uh, say, yes, 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 I follow Jesus. I follow God. We still have the same choice every single day. Will we obey God or will we choose to disobey God? So where is God leading you today? Are you a believer that's not just a fair weather believer like the Israelites here they're showing they're fair weather uh, believers that if God is keeping life easy and happy and obviously nice for them and good for them then yeah they'll follow God but we're not grumble complain God's against us may as well have just gone died in Egypt better than dying out here what about us you know grumbling and complaining by itself is not an issue. It's not a problem. But we need to think about why we're doing it. We need to look for the answers to that. It's not in blaming God like the Israelites were doing. But if we feel that way, why are we feeling that way? What is God's answer? Because it's not God that's causing us to feel that way. Do we need to sacrifice something? Do we need to uh, stop doing something in our life? Do we need to give up something? Do we need to change our thinking? Do we need to change our friend groups? Do we need to get into God's word more? Do we need to pray more? Do we need to talk to more mature Christians just to understand what is happening and to understand that even when we have doubts, we can still trust and have faith and believe in a God that acts. And God is leading today just as he led the Israelites out of Egypt. He just wants his people to follow him. So today, where is God leading you? Where, where, what is exciting in your life that God can do with you? In our church, in your own home, in our community. As God leads, where will we follow? As God leads you, today, where will you follow him? What choice are you going to make? Let me pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God who leads. You challenge us to follow you, to obey you, to put you first. Father, I pray that we'll be able to do that this week. Lord, help us, maybe in the busyness of life or maybe with COVID-19 covering our thoughts at the moment, that we can actually just stop and see where you are leading. Because in the midst of this, we know that you're in control. Life might seem out of control for us, but it's not to you. So Lord, as you lead, help us to see it and then help us to follow. Father, we have the same choices that the Israelites had all those years ago. Each day, help us to make the choice to put you first. We thank you for this today in your name. Amen. Well, again, thank you very much for joining with me today. It's great that we can catch up like this. And just a reminder, uh, you can still catch up with Kerry and myself on a Wednesday night at 6.30. Just go to Facebook and then look up Casino Baptist Church uh, and you can join us for Facebook Live there for half hour, an hour, just to chat about uh, life that's going on and some new information that we may or may not have. With COVID-19 at the moment, uh, everything is changing, not probably daily, but almost weekly. And we know God's in control. And as soon as we know of any information that we need to pass on to you, then we will do that. And just a reminder, if you are a friend or family of the church and you regularly come, but you can't on a certain Sunday, please call myself or Julie to let us know. My prayer for you is that as you'll seek out how God wants to lead you, and then you'll put up your hand and say this week, God, I will go where you lead. And may God give you the strength to do it. Bless you all. Look forward to catching up with you next Sunday.